Some of you know me. My name's, my name's Bob Ayers. I've been in the computer business looking around, maybe not the, before many of you were born, but getting there. Uh, and Silicon Valley, I've worked for Xerox and uh, for DEC Research and for Adobe. And I just retired from Adobe. Uh, and I've been interested in documents ever since uh, basically the era of the Xerox Star Workstation, which may ring a bell with some people, which was approximately started in 1975 as an outgrowth from Xerox Park and their workstations. So I've been interested in you know, displaying documents on screens and looking at them uh, pretty much since then. And uh, most recently at Adobe for 13 years, I was, uh, I was very interested in Adobe's portable document format and how that relates to displaying documents. And uh, some people get lessons faster than others. I got a couple lessons really, really late in, in my career, and I'm basically going to try and make two, mo two main points in this talk. And they're sort of mundane points, but maybe they're interesting because they sure didn't, didn't come to me early. It took me a while. And while I was making this, preparing this talk, I noticed that I was pushing into the area that T.B. Raman's very interested in with accessibility. Uh, so uh, I'm going to give this talk fairly fast, and, and then Raman can sort of move it into the era of, of you know, not of uh, access media other than display devices. So legacy documents. Everybody's been saying the printed page is going away. Uh, they're not going away. They're even being created. I can remember 15 years ago, people insisting to me that textbooks were dead, that every student would have e-books and they'd be wonderful because there'd be physics experiments right inside the book. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm still waiting. So all that stuff is still there, and uh, you can wait for the new era, or you can adapt. And you know, Adobe's made quite a lot of money by betting on what amounts to old book formats and old paper surviving. Um, by the way, anybody wants to interrupt at any time, ask questions, uh, feel free. Um, so what's, what did legacy documents look like? First of all, they're, they tend to be paginated. They're not HTML scrolls. Uh, the idea is you're looking at a page, and then you look at the next page, et cetera. Um, they may be structured. That is, you may have a file that's got interesting stuff like paragraphs and sections, or you may have a really old legacy document, which is basically just a, a, uh, you know, a scan. Um, the, for, the document was formatted. Okay? Some process decided the picture of the dog goes on page five, probably because the description of the dog went on page five. That process could have been completely automated, like what happens if you press the print button in HTML. It could have been completely manual, like all books were made up to like 1975. It can either be sort of interesting, or it can be absolutely vital if the text reads the equation on the bottom of the page will show you that, then the equation better be at the bottom of the page. So there's been a whole history of how to deal with legacy documents in the computer age. Uh, I'll just put a little idea from Adobe, because that's my most recent thing. Adobe started out, reproduce the sheet of paper. Feed me eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper, you get eight and a half by 11 pseudo sheets of paper out. And you know, Adobe's had a lot a lot of bad press over the last dozen years. Oh, PDF is just good for legacy documents. Oh, I can't read PDF on small screen. On the other hand, they've done pretty well in that business. Um, as soon as Adobe Acrobat was launched with PDF, everybody realized an eight and a half by 11 document on a five by seven screen wasn't the world's best thing. Reading aids came, came in, kept getting added to Adobe Acrobat, which is now probably 20 times the size that it was when, when it was launched. And these have taken various forms. There's scaling, there's scrolling. There was a feature that probably nobody in this room has ever seen that, it, that, would, that, would, that would run you through two column text by running you down the first column and then down the second column if you, had, if you hit the arrow keys, if the document was structured right. Um, there was word extraction. There's refonting for better, better visualization. There's various form of linking. There's searching, okay? all things that are 
you know, dynamic computer-based stuff operating on what amounts to legacy pages. Um, then more recently, Adobe did simple, doc simple page relayout, which I actually did, which is in current Acrobat. Some people know where it is, some people don't, where um, Acrobat will actually attempt to take a legacy document and turn an eight and a half by 11 inch page, single page, into a page that's as wide as your screen without scaling, which probably means since, you know, more or less conservation of area, if your screen is, is five inches wide, you'll end up with a five by 22 inch page, which may not be wonderful, but it's a lot easier to read than one that we have to scroll left and right. Uh, and the next obvious step forward is document relay out where you relay out the whole document so now the pages are, quote, the right size. And the first thesis of this whole talk is that whole line of reasoning works for screens that are more or less the size of pages and fails on small screens. And I'll pursue that in the next slide. So there's been a lot of research in Relayout. I've done my share. Uh, the most public stuff was done by David Salison at uh, Microsoft. Uh, if you have a document, you may have metadata, you may not. Um, uh, you might think that if you had all of the metadata, that you could do a perfect relayout. That is, suppose that you, you and I know that the document was originally laid out by a computer program looking at this collection of document metadata and these uh, environment facts, like what kind of, what size the pages are. You might imagine if you could just, if you just could get that program again and change those little variables, say, no, it's not an eight and a half by 11 page, it's a, a, a four page, and press the button, you'd get, quote, the right answer for the relay out process, because that's how the first one came. My thesis is that's right if you're converting from eight and a half by 11 to eight by 10, maybe even seven by five, but it doesn't scale down. Why doesn't it scale down? And I say it doesn't scale down, not through any theoretic sense, but from trying to read stuff on small screens. It, the first reason, main reason it doesn't scale down is because the whole notion of page layout implies there are multiple things together on the page that are arranged in some beneficial way. As you scale, move the size of the page smaller and smaller, fewer and fewer what you might think of as document atoms fit on the page. When only one document atom fits on the page, you're not positioning things anymore relative to one another. And we can debate about whether the atom is the word or the paragraph. But at some point, the whole idea that you're looking at a collection of atoms that are, that are arranged in a manner which is both aesthetically pleasing and also beneficial for the reading experience falls apart. Oh my, what are we going to do about it? Well, the, counter for us is we have a dynamic medium here so that we don't have to just relay out. We don't have to create the visual experience of we reprinted Moby Dick, but we printed it on one of those little itty bitty books you can buy that only has two by four inch pages, right? We, or Moby Dick's about it. That might actually work, but a physics textbook on two by four inch pages with lots of, lots of illustrations. Um, so you step back, you say, okay, We've got a problem that is we can't scale things down to the kind of portable devices that are coming in via the, what the historic layout process. The good news is we've got a dynamic medium there, so we have an escape hatch. So that was the first thesis. You can't just keep scaling things down if you write a computer program that does a marvelous job of relay out, and you relay out onto two by three inch pages, and in fact, you get the correct answer. You know, your, your, um, your algorithms, you know, did a search of giant space and used all the facts and you got the right answer. It's still not what the user wants because he doesn't want his physics textbook scaled down to two by three inch page surrogates. Um, what he wants is the dynamic medium. And today we can see that. You know, there's lots of things you can look at, not particularly physics textbooks, but there's some of them on the web that are, quote, dynamic and don't have page break problems. What they do have is a different problem, which is 
you lose context. I mean, every day I read, a, uh, I look at a page and it says, click the photograph and make it bigger. And I click the photograph and what happens? Wham! I'm looking at a very large photograph. If I'm lucky, it's captioned. But I'm just looking at a photograph. It's not like the experience of looking at a textbook and say, moving it closer to look at the, make the photograph larger. The whole context has gone away. So that's the second point that I see. Along with the dynamic medium, we need to find a way to retain the context in the same sense that people did with old legacy documents, where it was really easy, because you couldn't go wham and find yourself at page 87. You know, there were times when you had to like look in the glossary and stick your finger in between the pages. Okay, pe people are used to that, but um, you don't sort of suddenly, you're not suddenly sort of reading a physics textbook and then you say, where am I? How do I turn the page backward to get where I was? Okay, you don't have that experience. And you have that experience all the time now on the web. Uh, why? Well, I think it's because it was sort of the cheap answer in HTML 1.0. So I bring back the layout issues and I say, what should you do when you're looking at a printed page of something like a physics textbook and you want to take advantage of the dynamic medium? You don't jump to a bigger copy of the picture. Enlarge the picture in place. What do I mean by that? I mean, go back to the example of we imagine we can, we can perfectly relay out things. Imagine that we took that, old, that example I used of the, the uh, we're going to relay out the, the book by going, appealing to the original layout process and changing the page size. So imagine going back to there changing the page size, and then scaling the photograph, and then saying, process, relay out the page. Suddenly, what would happen well, on page 57? You'd get a bigger picture of a dog, but it would still look like a laid out book, and the dog is still in context, and you can get to the dog by moving forward or backward. So if the guy says, make a picture bigger, and he's looking at a web page, you shouldn't jump him to a bigger copy of the picture. You should create him a web page where that picture is bigger. But not impossible to do. And the same thing holds throughout. Don't jump to a reference. I see that every day on the page, too. Here it says, you know, and so-and-so claimed that one. And you click one, wham! You're back there on, you know, what mounts to page 657, looking at one, two, three, four. You expand it in place. You have a dynamic medium. You've got an optional exposition somewhere. You, know, you don't want to put a big parenthetical phrase in. Fine, put an empty parenthetical phrase in, hide it. And if the guy clicks it, don't go wham. Expand it out in place and do the relay out. Your computer's fast, okay? You can do that. You see actually a little bit of the, of the show hide thing now uh, in blogs, uh, turning on visible bits. Um, you know, people put a little quiz in and say, click for answer. Uh, that's the expansion in place kind of thing I'm talking about, but that's just sort of mundane, one-dimensional stuff. But there's no reason why you can't imagine relay out, relaying out the entire page or document with slightly different ground rules. Hey, the reference is there, the footnote is there, whatever. So that's basically all I want to say. Those are only two points. The relay out with a different page size works fine if the page is more or less the same area. And when the page size is small, it stops working. And if you're in the business of creating marvelous layout algorithms that divine wonderful information from the legacy document and then think deep about what would have happened with the layout program if I would merely said, the page is two by three and push the layout button. You may get a mathematically perfect answer, but it's not the answer the user is going to want if it's like a physics textbook. Taking advantage of dynamic media is, I hope, the fix. But the dynamic medium has to retain context. It has to retain the simplicity of the user experience. And how to do that is interesting, because of course, at some point, you can't expand the picture of the dog 
in place and keep a lot of context if the bigger picture of the dog is exactly the area of the user's itty bitty screen. So there's a lot going on there, but I, I claim that the answer is not going wham with hyperlinks. It's not even forward and back buttons. It's probably not even keeping a little representation of the tree of how you got to here up at the top of the screen. Um, I, I have trouble with those screen with those trees, and I'm a computer nerd. Okay, um, uh, so so those are my only only two points. And if you have sort of background questions or whatever on that, uh, I'll take them now. Otherwise, I'll let Ron explain to you why this is even more important when we're not talking about displays. Yeah, Jim. Quick question: Why not zoom the picture of the dog in place as opposed to re relaying on the page? Um, what, do you, what do you mean? You mean like zoom the page? No, the, the, the picture, the dog appears in some area of the page. Yeah. So you want it bigger, so it zooms within that area. Uh, because if I, and, and, and obscures the text which used to be immediately to its right? No, no. The, what? the frame stays the same. Just, so you have to scroll around and Okay, because if you, if you like zoom the whole page and then recenter the image, then you have the problem that the caption says, and then the dog, and it's off the right-hand side of the screen. What I'm saying is you ought to really out the page so that the, so that the, so that, so the caption wraps effectively. Yeah. Roman? Okay, so um, I started thinking of these problems many years ago when I was doing my PhD work where I was actually asking the question, what did it mean to effectively read documents? And um, that work actually led to building a system that read fairly complex mathematical documents. Wonderful piece of software that served a marketplace of one, um, namely me. Um, and then I moved on to other things such as you know making reading things effectively on the web. But a lot of this thing sort of comes back to the mobile space in a much more interesting way because at the end of the day, after you've used your mobile phone to do something, you actually want to, you are, the goal is to finally read the right information, right? You don't pull your mobile phone out of your pocket for the pleasure of clicking radio buttons or checking check boxes. What you're doing is you want to read the train timetable or you want to read that quick thing that you ask, wanted to check in a reference or whatever. So if you ask those questions of how do I take documents and then read it on a small screen, uh, this whole space becomes very interesting. Because just step outside the computer interface and ask all the questions about what documents work well for you. So newspapers work beautifully, right? You can fold up a newspaper so you're reading the sports column and that picture of this lines up with that thing, and there's a lot of context happening there. Similarly with a textbook, with table of index contents and indices and so on. So this whole question of how you take content and then leverage a dynamic display and hypermedia, but then take into account the fact that you have a small display, I believe is an area that we are all beginning to just crash the surface on. We've essentially, sort of gotten away to some extent on the desktop by not fully leveraging the dynamic nature of the display because the display is big. Um, on the small display, it becomes very interesting. And similarly, when you're doing spoken output, it becomes very interesting because what you have there is spoken interaction is essentially temporal. So you now have a one-dimensional time bound stream of content that's flowing by you. So you don't have the luxury of moving around it and browsing. So you're sort of there as a passive listener listening to this active stream flying by. In contrast to the paper world where you're used to this big display sitting there and your eye can look at up to the left corner and round to the bottom right corner. So for instance, one of the things that was very effective in the system I built for my thesis, um, you could actually give meaningful labels to things. So in a printed book, the following works very well, right? You read a proof, and it says, 
by theorem 7.5 and lemma 8.3, we get equation nine and hence the result. Now, admittedly, this is not the most user-friendly presentation of any content, but you will see this in mathematics books and physics books all the time. Now, this works well in the printed world. It does, it sort of is suboptimal in the online world, and it's completely unworkable in the spoken world. And what, what I had built in the, in the speech interaction system was um, when you read equation theorem 7.3 and as you understood it, um, you could label that Fermat's last theorem. And then all references to that thing would get replaced from being 7.3 to Fermat's last theorem. Because if you step back and ask, why is that thing 7.3? That act of numbering that equation 7.3 and using it in a reference as by equation 7.3 is an artifact of the batch-oriented typesetting, formatting, printing process. And when you are in a dynamic world, that can get late bound. So you know, a good Lisp hacker, good Python hacker, right? your immediate reaction is to say, let me use late binding to solve this problem. And late binding actually solves a lot of these problems that Bob's, Bob was talking about, both in terms of making very late bound decisions as to where you place things, and also how you name things. So if you bring up a web page, and you know, you're looking for we the weather forecast, if you go to weather.com, weather.com will try to tell you a lot of things. There's wonderful content there. But how do you narrow it down to the one thing you want is your challenge. And a lot of these things get addressed by dynamic resizing, what I call dynamic labeling, and then dynamic formatting. So Bob, you want to take it back, or? What is that? Yeah, sure. okay. Okay. I'll hang around here in case okay. you need me one day. I'll sort of melt away into the background. Sounds fair. So, so there, there's a bit of time here. So I'd like to expand on, on one or two things that I, that I, I wrote down in the notes uh, that are sort of you know, uh, more story instances about, the, about what I was pushing. Uh, um, a little, little war story. The first time I realized how important context was was at Sarks Park when the Altos were replaced by the Dorados, much faster computers. And at the time, uh, the Bravo text editor was running on the Altos, which turned into Microsoft Word, to give you a flavor. And they were fine text editors, and they had a scroll button just like everybody does today. And so you hit the, you know, you, you could hit the scroll button and sort of scroll the page up, say, half a page if you hit it in the right place. And on the Altos, scrolling worked fine. You could read pages and you could scroll them up and keep reading the page. And then they, moved the entire software system to the Drato, a much faster computer. And reading documents got much harder. And I couldn't figure it out for five or 10 minutes. What happened? In the days of Bravo, if you scroll the page up half a page, what happened? Somebody bit blitted the entire screen effectively up halfway, cleared the bottom half of the page, and then wrote a new text in it. Of course, exactly the same thing happened on the Dorado. But in Bravo, if you scrolled up roughly half a page, the line you were reading at the bottom jumped up half a page, but you could find it again. Because for like a quarter of a second, it was the last line above the white space. On the Dorado, they jumped it up and repainted the, the succeeding text all in a refresh time. And so when you scrolled up half a page, you didn't know which was the last line you read. You had to go find it again, okay? Simple little thing. You just lost context because the page jumped up, kabam, as I said earlier, you know, and you had to go figure out where you were. Uh, so, so there's a similar breakdown that happens today on the web. So, if you look at what you would think of today as a slightly old-fashioned web interface, um, you and think about an, an email interface for you know a web interface for reading email. The the old-fashioned web interface would go reload the page, and so if you're listening to it, you're listening to the new message, and life is clean. 
but it looks ugly because there is this visual refresh flicker going on. If you look at a new, uh, what I would call a more current day web interface, where you essentially update the contents of a, the inner HTML of a dev through script, and the whole page is the same, and a small part of that page changes, the visual experience is good. Um, if you're listening to it, you don't know what to listen to again. And so you get the same context break that Bob talked to you about. And a low vision user, not just a speech user, will run into the same thing because you have a big display. There's a whole mail summary over there. You can see all of this stuff. And then that one frame that contains the mail message that you're looking at changes. You actually have a hard time telling what changed unless you are actually completely capable of using that interface. And so the context the context break happens in many, many situations. And it's sort of always interesting to see a technology generation flip and then to sort of suddenly see, oh, that's why it worked in that old, old one and that's why it breaks in the new one. Yeah, uh, I'll make one more point about uh, displaying things in context. So what I didn't bring up in the original slides was um, there are some good examples of this in sort of the simple layout mode of, of um, source language editors. Some people call it progressive revelation, okay? You can tell your source editor, for instance, that you don't want to see anything that's indented more than, more than, more than four spaces. Collapse the whole structure, okay? So suddenly your for loop now only, you know, only is signified by the four and the whole loop content isn't there. And you can click it back and expand it back out in, in place. Okay, this is really, to my mind, a vital concept that shouldn't just be relegated to the issue of, to the popular thing of source editors. Now it's really easy to do with source editors because the whole thing is 1D. We're talking about lines and there's sort of no, no layout problem involved. You, you just, you know, kill off the lines or display them. But you can move that whole structure, okay? I can, you know, I can take my source program and I can say, eliminate all of the nested fours, okay, now eliminate all of the fours, now eliminate everything except the, except the, you know, except the procedure declarations, right? What is it like when you say everything except the procedure declarations? You're like you're looking at the table of contents of this source module. So you can imagine that whole thing applying in a book. I open up the book, I see a table of contents. I've got a dynamic medium now. I'm not restricted to what was going on in, in you know, 100 years ago. So in the table of contents, it doesn't say, you know, the beauty and the beast, page 11. It says the beauty and the beast. The entire chapter is there. It just is invisible. So I can double click it and the chapter appears. And we can carry the, we can carry the entire structure through mapping it from a progressive revelation source editor, you know, maybe all of the pictures are thumbnails until I click them. The footnotes, there isn't a footnote at, quote, the bottom of the page anymore. There may be a little one, but you don't have to have a one at the bottom of the page. Click the one and it expands in line, okay? Um, you know, and you can carry that on, on for yourself, but you can imagine a situation where, you know, the entire um, document, the entire presentation, whatever it is, is a tree, but instead of having to tree navigate and you know put up to the user what amounts to the path name of how he got to what he's looking at now up in the top line, you can expand. You know there will be you know click anything and expand it in line, click anything that's expanded to make it go away. And you know, you know I open up the book, I see the title, I click it, I see the, what amounts to, the, to all the chapter titles, I click the one I want. You uh, you know you you get the flavor. Uh, some sense, right? You see these kinds of things in tools like source code editors because those are tools built by software engineers for software engineers, and they might actually be further ahead in terms of exploiting all of the facilities of this medium than, say, things that we as software engineers have built for the rest of the world. Because, um, hey, you know, as Bob said, you know, hide everything up to beyond indentation level four, right? My fingers say metaphor control X dollar. That's what you do in Emacs, right? But, but if you think about it, there are two things that actually drive that. A, programming languages are very structured because they were designed to be parsed by the computer. They are structured and human, human consumed, documents for human consumption don't necessarily have 
that clean a structure. But there's also the other half of it, which is source code run editors have always done this because they, they were designed for programmers and yep. software engineers always build what is good for software engineers because it makes our life easier. Right, and I, I agree with that, and I'd add the one thing I'm, I'm enjoying, and also, because it's strictly 1D and line oriented, it also yes. is a very yes. easy problem. Yeah, absolutely, it's a much more, yeah. yeah. Questions, suggestions? So I have a question. Yeah. Your premise is that the screens are getting smaller. Yeah. Uh, here at Google, the screens are actually getting bigger, <laughs> if you look around. <laughs> no. We're software engineers, so maybe what we do for ourselves is not what we do for the people out in the street who are walking around with iPods and cell phones. But I, w I would just, as as a as a user of documents, much rather have a larger screen than technology that that somehow lets me read text on an iPod screen. Because even with the best technology that you're describing here. Uh, there's not enough information that fits on the page, just in, in number of bits. So well, I think you that, that, you know, I'm not knocking big screens. I think some of this generalizes even, even to big screens, like what, just what I said about expanding the table contents in place instead of having to jump to page nine. Uh, but I think that there are large trends that are going against big screens. In particular, you know, uh, you know, Business Week or something will tell you that, you know, the computer interface has arrived and it is the cell phone. Just because yeah, empirical observations, the empirical <laughs> observation says says people walking down the street, you know, just go out there and walk down the street, you will not see the majority of the people carrying a laptop. You will not see the majority of people carrying a notepad. You will not even see the majority of people carrying an carrying an iPad. But you will see the majority of the people carrying a cell phone. Um, you know, people have people have voted now. I don't know if that's strictly true or not, but uh, but it's certainly true that the computer the guy has with him is the one he's going to use. So there, there, there are a couple of other things you could say. Right? About ten years ago, I suddenly realized while I was reading Charles Dickens. So all those books are you know staged in England in the nineteenth century. Right? If you read those books, you observe something funny. People carry candles and lanterns into rooms. Okay. Nowadays, we don't carry candles and lanterns into a room. We walk into a room and flip a light switch, right? So at the time, I wrote something up where I said, well, you know, carrying a laptop with a display in the 20th century is like well, carrying a candle into a room in the 19th century. And we shouldn't be doing this. We should be carrying a portable device like a phone, walk into a room, and use whatever big display is hanging there. I believe that vision will happen. Um, so you probably will not be squinting at your iPod screen. But that said, even if you have a big screen, now this is the, this is the part of me that is greedy that is speaking. Right? So you, you could say, well, if I have a big screen, I could just do what I do in the print world today and lay out and be done with it. But the greedy part of me says, if I know how to do dynamic layout and do dynamic expansion and collapse, uh, and I can make that work on a small screen with a legacy document. Then with the big screen, I can consume 10 times as much information effectively as I do today with, say, a big screen and a legacy document. So there could be value in it either way. Sure, yeah. Right, because it's, it's you know, clearly all of the layout tricks we know to do on paper have developed over, what, 2,000 years? I mean, it, it took a big jump after Gutenberg, but even before that, we sort of knew how to do some of this. Yes. Um, so what does it mean for, you know, I'll uh, say now you have the computer display now, you have a big display, and you have the ability to render really rapidly. What, what can we do in terms of rendering that makes your whole task of consuming information more, more yeah, efficient? And you can also, I mean, I agree with Raman, it says at some point, you're walking into a room like this, you'll expect that there's some nice interaction medium around. And on the subway, maybe not. Um, but you can also upscale it, as Roman also suggested, which is today on your large screen, you come into your room, what do you see? You see 35 fairly small icons. And you double click one of them. Wham! As I said earlier. 
you know, the other icons are gone, right? You could imagine something more clever, like it expands in place and pushes the little icons out to the edges. So you see the relatively the same layout. The thing you want to read fills 80% of the screen, but all of the other icons are still there. They've been pushed out to the margins, but they're still sort of in their same relative geometric orientation. So if your mailbox was way over there on the left, your mailbox is still way over there on the left. Is that I, with Jeff Raskin's work? Uh, I've heard of it, but I haven't actually addressed it. Because some of the stuff he does is very text-based, where you just actually jump around in, in, the, in the document. But some of the, of the other stuff, I believe, that he's done uh, sort of suggests 3D interfaces like what you're describing, where you you always re you always keep context, but sort of different sections that you're interested in grow relatively in size. I think his humane interface book has an interesting example of a hospital information system navigation that they built using that. It doesn't seem to get a lot of traction with the big software vendors. Yeah, well, so there was a whole other talk about that says you know the the you know the the GUI hasn't really changed in 20 years in terms of uh, in terms of its expressive power, even though the computers are 100 times faster. But that's a but but that's a second talk. He moves it further away. From okay. Me. Yeah. So. Um, oh, did we mess up your video? Um, he, he just handed the mic over over this way. Uh, okay. So yeah, so I, I still like to see this this push. I agree with you about the large screen, but I say you know, if you grow the screen, in some sense, I can grow the problem space uh, okay. to bring up the icons, uh, bring up the icons and whatever. Uh, so, so I still like to see it. Yeah. Um, I mean, in some sense, display size is like memory and cycles on a computer, right? I mean, our handheld now has more cycles and more memory than a than a desktop machine, say, ten years ago. But, and you know, in the mid '90s, when the small devices were you know, getting popular like the pilot, a lot of the old programming tricks of how to program on small footprint devices suddenly became relevant. Now the small devices are no longer that small footprint. You just need to be able to build software the way you used to in 1990 to be able to program on those things. And it, it, but the target is still moving, right? It's and, and I can, you know, you, you guys are, you guys are probably, probably follow this route already, but I can, I can narrow it down to Google and say, why is it that when I'm looking at the first 10 hits in my Google page and I take the fourth one and I click it, why is it that the, all the 10 Google hits completely vanish? Why don't the, you know, the first three get pushed up and made small and the bottom six get pushed down and made small and the one I wanted to see occupy the middle 85% of my screen? Well, I claim, you know, it's work. <laughs> and, you know, and in some cases, unfortunately, it's work that, that it, one group can't do because it percolates over into a whole variety of, variety of other things. But I'd sure like to see it in terms of the, in, in terms of the context. Gmail is doing some of the things you're proposing some of the time. Yeah. At least mm -hmm. in, when you, once you're viewing one thread, yeah, that's a message example. expands yeah. in in yeah. context. That's a good example. And yeah. they, they actually they have a couple of levels where they compress the context more or less depending on how much there is. Right, and then they elide the thread contents and pre what the previous person said gets elided as a bunch of dots. That's yeah. 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 So I, I, actually that makes me think I'm hopeful that this, these kind of ideas will become more available as so if people figure out how to do this in Ajax or other browser technologies. Yeah. Of course, it gets much harder when you hit the, the end of one domain and you, you, you sort of have to you know, talk, talk to the next guy over. But that, that's a senior problem. Well, Google Images already displays the page containing the image with some other stuff next to it. So the, we have the technology. Um, you largely spoke about how content is displayed. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about the problems in manipulating or interacting with the content on the screen, uh, be it a handheld device or be it a, uh, a big screen? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's an interesting area about, you know, 
you know, I said blithely, you know, that you ask to make something smaller, you ask to make something bigger without at all going into the, into the gestures. Uh, and uh, uh, that's certainly an interesting, an interesting area because after all, something might not be both uh, small, smallable and biggable at the same time, depending on whether I want it to go down one more level or, or pop it up. So it's not just a simple gesture. Uh, but I claim, I claim no expertise in this area, but uh, Raman might have something more to say. Well, um, I think most of what I've worked on in this space has been around consuming content as opposed to producing, but some of the w stuff that you do in order to consume content in a clean way like this, which is to sort of leverage the structure and then do progressive revelation, also then helps you in manipulating things because once you have, so you know, you're sitting, well, yeah, so you're, you're using the structure of your code, say, to do progressive hiding and expanding. Then you often end up using that strange structure to refactor code. Um, again, given that I've always written all my documents in markup languages, I sort of end up doing the same thing on manipulating content, which is I end up manip manipulating structural blocks. Um, where I believe some of the interesting stuff needs to happen is between marrying a clean, simple to use GUI that you know, the rest of the world that doesn't like programming languages can use, while sort of retaining structure. I mean, there have been products in the past that have tried to do that, that have been you know, very XML, SGML oriented, like well, FrameMaker plus SGML comes to mind. Um, but I'm, given that those things weren't as successful as structure ad fans would have wanted, it's unclear whether it was because the user interface wasn't perfect or because too much of the world's information is more semi-structured than structured. So there is a continuum there where you have to find the right sweet spot. Because to make the manipulation easy, you want good structure. But if you put too much structure, then you end up getting too rigid. And the thing the guy wants to create doesn't quite fit that structure. And he, he completely escapes that model and goes to you know, a totally unstructured mess. So. Let me, uh, let, me, let me add a become a TV ramen. So there's been a history of what you might call two-view editors, okay? I can remember some from IBM a long, long while ago, where I not only reveal to you the, the laid out final result like you'd expect in a book, but I reveal to you the markup. And the idea is you can then navigate in the markup, okay? The, the markup is effectively manifesting you the tree over there in the, in the other window, uh, XML spy, okay? Uh, such, such products, such research experiments have sort of worked in the sense of they did what the authors said they were going to do, but never set the world on fire. So I suspect that's not the right answer from the actual yeah. human being's point of view. Yeah, I, I suspect that is, that, that's why I said there is a sweet spot that hasn't been discovered in that space. Um, that I think you, you hit the nail right on the head when you said that there's a lot more semi-structured than structured information. Yes. And sort of, I, I remember Python has a predecessor named ABC and it had a built-in syntax directed editor and it was too much in the direction of total structure control. No. No. And I sort of, I had a very strong negative reaction to that piece of code. So for Python, I sort of went the other way, Python didn't have anything built in. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, of course, there's support in, in Emacs and other editors that is definitely of the semi-structured basis. Yes. Because it, it recovers gently when, yeah. when, when, the, when the structure is, exactly. is sort of yeah. broken. Yeah. yeah, you want a continuum between the structure. See, you want a continuum. Here, 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 here is what happens, right? Most of the world's authors, will never give you structure if you tell them, give me all the structure, because they're lazy. Right? At the same time, in fact, what happens is most of the time, you realize there is some structure in one thing that you're doing only after you've done it three times. So if you have to sort of first figure out what the structure and what you're doing it is, even before you've done it once, you never do it. So, I suspect my gut feel about where that sweet spot is, is that you let people do things, and then as they are doing it, you let them discover that structure, 
And as they discover that structure, they tell you about it. And that's what I think of as the semi-structured world. So you know, you're writing a document, but as your document, when you do have a set of numbers that is you know, an equation or something, you get some extra brownie points for saying it's an equation because it just works better, and then therefore you do it. And then that world works because you progressively build it up. We're, uh, we're getting a bit into sociology here, That's but true. I agree with Raman. Yeah, that yeah, we're Ram, we are running I, out of time too. So I agree with Raman that you know the idea that you tell authors how to write their documents never worked in the past, and it's much less likely to work in the future because you know just read blogs these days. There's 50 million authors out there. But on the other hand, if you think about it, blogger, blog authors are in some sense more structured than the previous generation of HTML authors. At least they tell you what the blog thread is, what they are commenting on, which you know you didn't have in a flat HTML page. Right, so. Because they all use movable type. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or they use blogger.com or whatever else. But yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.